So today we're going to talk a little bit about our culture's fascination with death and rebirth. Death and coming back to life. Death and reanimation. Okay, fine, I'll just say it. We're going to talk about zombies. Uh, how many of you are big-time zombie fans? Any, don't be ashamed. It's okay. If you really like zombies, raise your hand. No? One or two. Okay, yes. Do we have a Walking Dead fan in the room? Yeah. A couple of you. All right. There, there is something about zombies. Um, Rebecca Thompson is perhaps, I think, our church's biggest zombie fan. Um, she will, well, I'll have to see what she thinks of this message. Uh, I personally don't really care for, for zombies. I'm, I'm not a zombie fan. I, under, I understand the appeal, though, and I think there's something to it. Uh, we'll talk about that appeal. What is it about that idea that appeals to us? Because it's about death and life, but it's also about violence and vengeance and retribution and um, uh, passion and angst and all of those other good emotions that go into the story surrounding the zombies. Sometimes the zombies are just a plot device to tell a story. Sometimes they're the main focus of the story. But we're going to talk about this idea of being dead and then coming back to life in those terms first, in, in the sort of zombification idea or, or mummies or, or other dead and reanimated things. Uh, but then we'll also talk about the difference between reanimation, reincarnation, and resurrection. What makes Christianity distinct and different? Because this is such a part of our cultural conversation. You might find an entry point into a conversation with someone about faith through talking about uh, zombies or mummies or reanimation. I'm sorry if this seems a little off the wall, but, but stick with me because there's some good solid meat in here. Maybe even some brains, too. Um, okay, that's a zombie joke. Zombies eat. Right, okay. Um, no, there's some serious material here that we need to talk about uh, because we are approaching Easter, and we're going to talk about resurrection. But first, let's talk about reanimation, reincarnation, those other ideas. And we'll see um, this death and life uh, be used in the context of this story. How Jesus uses this opportunity of resurrection, not just bringing him back to life. Before there were uh, zombies, there was Frankenstein, right? You remember Frankenstein? Well, okay, so Frankenstein was the doctor. Frankenstein's monster was the thing with the bolts in the neck that go, ah, okay, that's, let's get that clear. Uh, but before that, we can go back even further. Um, what were some of the original reanimated creatures? I've already said it once. The mummy. Another, mm, okay, Frankenstein, uh, the mummy, because mm, right? the mouth was sewed shut, right? Mm. Scary stuff. How the Egyptians, why the Egyptians did what they did to a corpse and then wrapped it up and then put it in a tomb. I don't understand how they got to the point um, where they would remove the brains with a long stick, where they would take the organs out and put them in special jars. Uh, the rituals surrounding mummification were bizarre. This is part of the world in which uh, our story is being told, in which our gospel takes place. All right, now, mummification was centuries before what we see happening in uh, the story of Jesus and Lazarus. Uh, but that's the context. Okay? The other ideas around death were that you died and your flesh rotted and you were dead. For the Hebrews, you were dead, you were dead. Now, if you went to Sheol, that was a special place of torment, but it's not like our concept of an eternal everlasting hell. And then the Greeks had their ideas as well, and Romans had something similar. They had Elysian fields. They had um, Tartarus, a place of torment and punishment. Uh, they had more of an everlasting concept of life. But for the Egyptians, there was this idea that uh, you lived on in an afterlife in a different form 
But in order to do that, you had to take care of earthly preparations first. Burial preparations, really what mummification was, were just fancy burial preparations. The idea was still, though, that uh, not that the mummy would live, but that there would be an afterlife in which you would live, and through the symbolic preparations of the mummification process, you would have everything you need, or at least the pharaoh would have everything the pharaoh needed, or the wealthy would have what they needed, Common people didn't get mummified and buried in the same way, unless they were special somehow. No, the mummy of our uh, childhood nightmares, uh, of those great old films, and perhaps even the modern films, whether they're great or not, is up for debate. Uh, Those sort of mummies are not the original concept of mummy. That was something invented to scare us and to startle us. No, the Egyptians understood that the mummy itself, the flesh, was not going to rise up and go, "Mm," and scare people. Now, the statues might come to life and hack you to death, but not the mummy. Let's just get it straight. Egyptology is its own kind of thing, but that's part of the world in which we have this gospel story. And it's the closest connection we have to being wrapped in shrouds of cloth. Did you catch that about Lazarus coming out of the cave? Lazarus come out, and the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, his face wrapped in a cloth. Well, what does that sound like? Mm, right? Unbind him and let him go. All right, that's pretty straightforward. Unwrap him. But he's not a, a dead thing walking, although it says the dead man came out. No, this line between death and life is kind of blurry here. Jesus says it in a way that hints at what he's getting at. And the way I prayed during our prayer of the day was very specific. From life to life everlasting. We're alive now. And then we die. But are we really dead? Well, who can know? I knew a man who had spent most of his life researching near-death experiences collecting first-hand accounts and stories and conversation. And he was absolutely and utterly convinced and convincing to talk to of people who had had near-death experiences. Maybe you yourself have had such an experience or know someone who has. Uh, What happens when this we shuffle off this mortal coil is really a broad range of ideas out there. So Jesus says that uh, he's not dead, but alive. But no, first he says he's asleep, and the disciples don't get that. Um, They think that he's just, well, he'll be fine if he's asleep, but then he says he's dead, and then they're still thinking political thoughts about how, well, the Jews are out to kill Jesus. Maybe they got to Lazarus because he was Jesus' friend, and all right, they're going to get us, but we're going to follow Jesus even into the jaws of death. Put on your swords, here we go. Um, Their idea of death is still mixed up in life, and the, the act of dying itself. You know, Jesus points it out, he is dead. That's a particular issue I have. Uh, when someone dies, you say they're dead. To say they passed is a nicer way of saying it, but why not just say dead and death? Well, because we don't like that word. We don't like the finality of that sound. We don't like the idea that death is the end and that it's, you're done. There's sort of a crudeness or an abruptness to this idea of death, whereas to say it's one past uh, is gentler. And there's a time to be gentle. I understand that. The reality is the same and remains unchanged. Dead is dead. Unless you get reanimated somehow. Now let's talk a little bit about many, many Tekel Parsons and, and all of the craziness that goes on uh, with reanimating the dead. And see, we have here this reading from Ezekiel, and what does that sound like? O prophet, speak to the bones. Say the incantations. I'll put it in a different way. That's not exactly what it says, but speak to the bones. Can these bones live? Now, these are dry bones. These are skeletons laying around. I guess that's perhaps uh, an earlier version the skeleton dance. People would wear black suits with 
bones sewed on and dance against the black backdrop and make it look like the skeletons were dancing. There was a sort of reanimation, but we all knew that the skeletons were not really alive. Ray Harryhausen, the special effects genius, did a lot to convince us that skeletons could not only be alive and move around, but could have sword fights uh, with, who was it, Jason and the Argonauts? Um, if you've ever seen that famous sword fight where the skeletons run around and they make this clacking sound as they move, don't they? Because they're bones. That's actually just sticks that they kind of clack together. Found some dry sticks. Beat them here. Oh, we want to see these bones come back to life. Why? Because the Lord wants them to come back to life. There's something in a way the Lord challenges Ezekiel and says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel has the right answer. You, Lord, you know. It's up to you. I can't make them live. But yet God says to Ezekiel, you say to the bones, speak to the bones. And then the bones get sinews and flesh, muscles, all of their bits and skin, but they're still now just bodies laying around. Now he says, speak to the breath. Now that's interesting that the Lord doesn't just breathe in them the breath of life, but the Lord commands Ezekiel to speak to the breath. Ezekiel, command the breath, prophesy to the breath. And the breath goes back into them and then they live. Now I could back up for a second and say, well, of course, these aren't literally bones. This really isn't a literal army of people. But instead, it's a prophetic dream in which we have a, a vision of life restored to Israel. Because is that what God says? This is the house of Israel. Right now, they are like dry bones. They're like the dead. They're as good as dead. And not only that, they're as good as dead without flesh. They're just bones. Throw them to the dog to chew on. They're not worth much. Ah. But God can bring life, and through the prophet can speak life. And this idea of humans being used to speak life, to bring life to an inanimate thing, and animate it. And not only that, a thing that was previously animated, be reanimated. What does Dr. Frankenstein use to reanimate his creation. Electricity, right? Lightning. He raises the body up into a tower and throws switches and all kinds of Jacob's ladders go off. Isn't it interesting that those, you've seen those two wires and the electric arc goes between them, goes zirp, zirp. Have you seen that? It's called a Jacob's ladder. Um, biblical term for an electrical device. So we have this electrical power being channeled down into the body again. And I bet there's some chemical concoctions he probably uses, too, and you know, some stitching to get all the body parts back together in the right order. And he's brought it back to life. Being comes back to life, and as the, how does the story go? He's got the wrong brain, and so it's a violent killer now. An abnormal brain, yes. All right. Glad you're following along. This is still reanimation. This is the idea that tissue can be reanimated. Whether it's in Ezekiel, in a, a literal sense, or a, excuse me, a figurative sense, representing Israel, reanimating in a spirit sense, or in a physical, literal sense with uh, Frankenstein, it's a reanimation of tissue. It is not resurrection. It is reanimation. All right, zombie fans, how much of the zombie's original personhood remains in the zombie? None. It's just reanimated flesh. The person's gone, but the flesh, the violent, brain-hungry flesh remains. Without getting too deep into those details, ugh. <laughs> what about reincarnation? Now, there's an idea. That when you die, some spirit of you lives on and yet has come back in a new form. And here's the cool thing about re uh, reincarnation. I've got to get my terms right. You can be reincarnated as anything. It doesn't have to be another person. 
Oh, you can go to spiritualist mediums who will tell you who you had been in past lives, but I have yet to hear of one who tells a person what things they have been in past lives. It's usually a list of persons with very interesting histories, um, you know, stories concocted by these spiritualists. So, who have you been in a past life? And the question is, what have you been? See, for, for Buddhists, the idea of reincarnation is simply a way to accumulate karma to, uh, of sorts, that's the wrong word for Buddhism, but you get the idea. Uh, it's the idea of accumulating these, these points to your credit so that at the end you can dissipate into nothing. See, reincarnation is the circle of birth, life, sickness, old age, and death over and over and over again. And if perhaps you are reincarnated into a stone that is then used to be built into a temple, Oh, you're assured a place. Uh, well, not really. You're assured no place, actually, uh, in nirvana. Nirvana is not like heaven. Nirvana just means an emptiness, a nothingness, so that when you die, you evaporate and you're done. You get off of that treadmill. You get off of that wheel of life, birth, life, and birth, and rebirth again and again. It's nothing like the eternal life that Christians talk about. It's not similar in any way. You're not reborn uh, like a spirit baby plucked from heaven and put into a body. Ah, now there is a Mormon idea that they don't like to talk about much. How many spirit babies are there? Only a fixed number. And how many will be born on earth? Only so many. And once they're all done, well, then it's time for the second coming to happen. Right? So many crazy ideas about rebirth out there. Our culture is latching on right now to this idea of zombies, but it's, it's a cyclical thing that's been around and it's going to come around again. We like the idea of a reassured rebirth or a better life. Or maybe we just like to see uh, zombies hacked up. I don't know. But we have a craving and a hunger for knowledge of life beyond death. So here we get a great example of that from this story. Not only from Ezekiel, Ezekiel's not so much, it's more of a metaphoric story. We get promises and assurances from Romans, not in eight in this passage, but in the part that talks about nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not even life nor death. But here, here in the story of Lazarus, a resurrection story. Lazarus is alive again. Lazarus died. Lazarus is back to, back to life. Not his flesh in some other form. Not stitched back together and zapped with electricity. Not some magical spell that brings him back to life for evil purposes. Lazarus comes back to life. Why? Because the Savior commands it. The authority and power that Jesus possesses is to bring us from death to life. It's that simple. We don't have to complicate it with any other ideas. It's just straightforward. There's some beautiful, beautiful ideas in that too. Jesus, Jesus calls Lazarus by name. Jesus will call us by name. Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. Oh, I've heard some great sermons on that, and there's a book by that title, Unbind That Man and Let Him Go. All about the things in this life that bind us. I mean, you can go all sorts of metaphoric ways, but why take it away from its original point? Lazarus was dead. Jesus brought him back to life. That ought to be enough of a promise for any of us. So that when we are dead, Jesus will call us back to life. Isn't that good news? I certainly think so. Now, what happens in between? What heaven's like when we get there, how long we stay there, whether we sleep in the grave and are raised by the trumpet call? I mean, all of those other bits, we can worry about that as we go. But ultimately, the result is the same. We go from death to life and life everlasting. Amen.